Welcome to the launch webinar for the Swiss Sustainable Investment Market Study 2021. My name is Sabine Doebbeli. I'm the CEO of Swiss Sustainable Finance, and I will guide you through today's webinar. We are very welcome, very happy to welcome so many attendees to today's webinar. And we much look forward to present to you the key findings of our study. It's actually the fourth that we carried out uh, jointly with the Center for Sustainable Finance and Private Wealth at the University of Zurich. But before we start, let me just give you quickly some information about technical details of today's webinar. We do have the Q&A option active and we encourage you to use it. We'll do our best to use the roughly 30 minutes we have for Q&As to answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this event and also the presentation will be available online after the webinar. And we now also stream it live on the YouTube channel. Let me now briefly introduce the different speakers to you. First, we will hear a welcome note from our president, Jean-Daniel Gerber. He will let us know where he sees sustainable investing positioned in Switzerland today, but also where he sees room for further development. Then Kelly Hess, director of projects, who was responsible for the market study, will present you the key findings of it. Professor Timo Busch, who was responsible for the study from the side of CSP, will provide an academic perspective on the gradual shift to impact-oriented approaches. We will then hear Anja Bodenmann, project manager at SSF, that will follow with an overview on regulatory developments. And as our last speaker, speaker Victor Van Horn, director of Eurosif, will provide his view on key developments in the European market. By the way, SSF has recently joined Eurosif and we much appreciate to now be part of this key association that contributes to shaping European frameworks for hopefully effective sustainable finance solutions. With this, I'm now happy to hand over to Jean-Daniel Gerber for a brief welcome note. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, meeting. By the way, it is the last meeting that I'm chairing uh, because I'm going to leave uh, SSF arriving at the end of my six year tenure. Ladies and gentlemen, when I started six years ago, investment in financial products were still considered to, be, to bear less returns than classical investments, or at best, equal returns. However, year after year, practice and studies have shown that these returns are at least as high and often higher than classical investments. Swiss investment is nowadays the main trend among asset managers and asset owners. Very naturally, SSF followed the growth trend, or vice versa. Its membership grew from around 60 members six years ago to more than 170 today. According to the yearly collected figures, which you will hear soon, Swiss investment increased on a more than sustainable investment increased on a more than double digit percentage annually. This is impressive. And the fourth market study once again confirms the mainstreaming of sustainable investments. Considering the changing environment here at home and internationally, this development comes as no surprise. But we at SSF are now focusing quite more on the question of qualitative aspects of sustainable investment. The need to provide further clarity on the different objectives 
numerous sustainable investment approaches is becoming a prerequisite for client trust. The speakers often we will touch this issue. Our intention is to contribute to foster the reporting quality of sustainable investments. SSF will soon publish ESG transparency recommendations for portfolios. The goal is to provide a set of data that offer a concise overview of the ESG performance of a portfolio. With this project, we aim to promote an agreement on relevant reporting items that allow investors to judge and compare the ESG performance of assets. Even more importantly, towards the end of this year, SSF intends to present a comprehensive roadmap for the Swiss Financial Center. The roadmap lays out a plan for the many players, among them you, involved in sustainable financing, illustrating what their role should be in the transition to a more sustainable future. The roadmap outlines key steps for the Swiss financial sector actors to fully integrate the principle of sustainable finance into their actions and operations. This report will serve as a tool for ongoing dialogue with all the participants in the financial system about how to best achieve our common goal of a sustainable future. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by thanking wholeheartedly Sabine Dubbly and her team that promoted so efficiently sustainable finance during my tenure as president. Let me also thank you for your attendance at our and your year-long support. I wish you all the best in the continuing to promote sustainable finance in the future, as you have done during my presidency. Thank you very much and have a good meeting. Thank you so much, Jean Daniel, for these words, looking back, but also giving us an outlook on where we stand, still have to, uh, what we still have to work on. And definitely there will be more to come this year from SSF. But now we don't want to hold back any longer. I now hand over to Kelly Hess for the presentation of the key findings of this year's market study. Great, thank you, Sabina. So first and foremost, I want to thank all those who participated in the study, providing us the data to produce this report. And we have to really give credit where credit is due. So thank you to our counterparts at the participating organizations for putting in this time. Um, and those counterparts are continuously growing. So this year we saw a 10% increase in participation with just over 80 total participants. About 60% were coming from the banks and asset managers and 40% from asset owners. I look forward to giving this brief overview, but um, please definitely do visit our microsite and um, download the full report to, to get some more insights. So for this study, we looked at all volumes applying one or more of the eight commonly accepted SI approaches. Those eight approaches range from exclusions and best in class on the one side, generally seen as approaches designed to uh, more to avoid ESG risks, to more concentrated approaches of engagement, thematic investments and impact investments on the other side, generally seen as approaches that really identify specific ESG issues uh, where an investor would like to see a change and have a real world impact. We have to keep in mind that our study is very broad in its scope. It takes into consideration all volumes that apply one or more of these eight approaches, but that does not mean that every investment reported is 100% sustainable or, or has even the same level of sustainability. And this is certainly a much broader def definition compared to what we see coming out of the EU and their definitions. 
Uh, there we see that it's, um, the EU is turning out to be to have quite focused definitions when we speak about sustainable products in the sense of their wording used to describe Article 9 products, for instance. Our study illustrates uh, on a more general level how ESG aspects are applied within financial market practices and products. So where do we stand today? Well, uh, we're really happy to announce that we've now record over 1.5 trillion Swiss francs that are applying one or more of the SI approaches. This is a 31% increase from last year's reported figures. And just as last year, the strongest growth was from the asset manager and bank segment with funds seeing an increase of 48% and mandates 29%. And of particular importance is, is really to mention that these growing fund volumes now represent 52% uh, of the overall fund market. So in other words, over half, over 50% of the Swiss fund market is now applying one or more of the SI approaches. We also saw growth, but to uh, a bit of a lesser extent from the asset owners and overall, we defined uh, two main con contributors to this growth. First of all, definitely a wider adoption of ESG approaches to existing assets of participating organizations. And secondly, there was a, a, a quite a substantial positive market performance in 2020, which accounted for about one third of the observed growth. When it comes to the individual approaches, uh, Let's now look at where we saw the most movement in 2020. So here you see the changes in volume linked to each approach. And we've actually integrated a new feature in the graph this year to help you gain a bit more orientation on the left side of the graph. It shows the percent of total SI volumes reported that use each individual approach from the most commonly used ESG integration, standing at 71% of total volumes, to impact and thematic investing at six and 5% respectively at the bottom of the chart. This year, we were excited to see that engagement moved up from the third to the second most applied approach. I think this shows that market players are seeing the value in engagement and its ability to bring about change within the organizations they invest. This also likely reflects the popularity of various engagement platforms that are gaining a lot of momentum uh, in the recent years, such as uh, just as one example, Climate Action 100 plus. Towards the bottom of the chart, impact investing also saw substantially high growth rates this year, and for the first time has now jumped from last place um, to second to last place in terms of volumes. We do have to say that this is probably also, that this probably also reflects how impact investing is being in a way reinterpreted by many players. We know through our conversations that players no longer look at impact investing as purely a developing market and private market approach, but it's also being applied to the listed space across all regions. We also know that some thematic investments are being classified by players as impact products. And this is uh, also in, a, in line with how the EU defines this for Article 9, uh, but again, how we interpret uh, the Article 9 wording uh, is, is up for discussion. Uh, so therefore, some of this growth is likely due to players reporting some of their already developed sustainable investments as impact investments, as long as they can show that they measure and report on impact. But uh, we'll actually probably take up this debate a little bit later in the discussions um, with our deep dive with Professor Timo Bush from an academic perspective. When it comes to the use of multiple approaches for the same buckets of investments, um, the picture is clear that more volumes are applying a greater number of approaches. So we don't necessarily correlate higher quality with a higher number of approaches 
but we definitely do think that there are useful and effective combinations. You can see in the pie chart, the proportion of volumes applying many approaches um, that's reflected in kind of the dark, the darkest blue color and the, the lightest blue color. So four or more uh, approaches that's seen growth, a lot of growth last year, while the proportion of volumes uh, on the on the right side of the pie chart, so more in the middle shades of blue have kind of shrunk. So in other words, volumes applying only one or two approaches decreased significantly while volumes applying three, four, or more increased um, to a total of 71% from 57% last year. So we can conclude that it has become more common to combine a greater number of approaches. And that's a very encouraging signal that players are becoming a bit more sophisticated in the way they invest. And if you look even more deeply into the data for both asset managers and asset owners, uh, the highest volumes were actually linked to investments applying four approaches in combination. And both for the, both these segments, asset managers and owners, this included ESG engagement. So it's also an encouraging sign to see that seeking impact and dialogue with companies has taken on such a prominent role. Another key development showing us how the market is developing is the ever increasing proportion of SI volumes linked to the private or retail markets. When we look at the breakdowns between volumes held by private versus institutional investors, we see that there was more relative growth uh, in, the, in the private segment. Last year, 21% of the reported SI volumes was held by private investors. And this year, with a growth rate of 72%, that jumped to 28% of total volumes. We think the reason for this is twofold. So it's from both the supply and demand side. On the one hand, providers continue to integrate sustainable investment approaches across their full asset ranges, hence improving supply, the supply of SI products. And through our conversations with some of these providers, some have even reported that sustainable investment options have become basically the default within their organizations for retail investors and investors would actually need to actively opt out of these products. And on the other hand, uh, we also see increasing demand, obviously, from private clients for such investments. Uh, as the market matures, private clients have become more aware of alternatives to, to the plain vanilla options that they've been historically offered. And this observation also holds true for the institutional investor side. So although the proportion held decreased, sustainable assets held by asset owners still increased on, on absolute terms. The story of marketing and labeling is also quite an interesting story to follow. There seems to be a definite trend towards more transparency and credibility. Based on the data, we now see that one third on the left in the left chart, one third of reported funds and mandates are marketed as sustainable. And that's up from one quarter last year. So from one quarter to one third this year. And we feel this kind of reflects the need for organizations to be more transparent towards their clients, really making their sustainability efforts as visible as possible and likely also because it is more and more demanded by clients. On the right side uh, of the slide, another interesting topic was labeling. So here we also asked if the volumes reported were linked to any third party certified label, for instance, the FNG label or Lux flag. And the volumes linked to a label grew substantially from 6% last year to 32% this year, uh, which is quite a huge jump in our opinion. We were very specific to not include simple transparency labels, which we feel do not say much towards the quality of the products, but rather try to refer to quality linked labels. With the growing volumes of private and retail 
uh, or private or retail investors, we feel that from the side of the private clients, there is demand for more orientation through the use of labels to help them identify suitable products. Uh, the growth in the use of labels may also be linked to Swiss actors wishing to stay competitive in an ever-changing market, as on the EU side, um, it is quite common to use such labels. And the topic of labels will only receive more and more attention now that developments on the EU, uh, with considering the developments on the EU side, uh, which aim to define exactly how sustainable products should look. In Switzerland, we need to make sure that we're involved in these discussions on a national and international level, and make sure we are all speaking the same language when it comes to sustainable investments. So that was, um, that was just a brief overview of some of the main findings from our report. But again, I encourage you to look at our microsite um, and check out a bit more of what's behind the scenes. And with that, I hand back over to Sabina. Thank you so much, Kelly, for these detailed insights. Before we now move on to our next speaker, we would like to hear the opinion of our audience. And we've prepared a short poll on the following question. Which approach would you consider as most effective to achieve real world impacts within your listed equity investments? Would that be exclusions, ESG integration, engagement, or thematic investments? You should now be able to see the poll and can choose, can make your choice, We still give you some time to take your choice. And I guess we should now soon have an overview on the opinion of our audience on this question. If yes, we can see the results. Well, the opinion of the audience is quite clear. Engagement is the favorite. Through engagement, you can hopefully bring real world companies to move forward on sustainability topics, but you also name ESG integration, thematic investments, but to a lesser extent exclusions. Thank you for this picture. I think it shows that our audience also sees engagement as key. With this, I now hand over to our next speaker, to Professor Timo Busch, who will give us his academic view on these developments. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sabine. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure being here today and um, to reflect a little bit on the outcome of this year's study from an academic point of view. Um, let me start by saying that the debate about what impact investments are and what impact means for the entire field of sustainable investment um, has gained a lot of um, traction in academia recently. And uh, for that, I mainly see um, two reasons. Um, the first reason being uh, when, when we look historically at the market and specifically in the Swiss in Switzerland, uh, the field of impact investments uh, has a long tradition, and um, I'm, I'm thinking about the microfinance field here specifically. Um, so there were um, impact investments out there for a long time, and at the same time, uh, we now observe that more and more market participants label um, uh, investment products uh, as, as somewhat related to impact, as an impact investment product. So this raises the question, is that all the same? Or are there differences, right? So first question, uh, and first reason for why academia engaged uh, in this debate. Um, the second reason being, uh, as we've seen also with this year's report, uh, the market vo volumes increase and increase. So we are definitely in the mainstream with ESG. Uh, and uh, this naturally then comes uh, to the, the question, um, okay, what are, what are the effects of all these efforts, right? So for instance, uh, at um, the CSP, 
at the University of Zurich, we work quite a lot with these whole uh, so-called high net worth individuals. Um, and, and they ask the question, uh, how can we achieve change with our money? Uh, and therefore also there, the question is in the room, um, what are the effects, what are the um, outcomes um, of ESG sustainable investment strategy? Yeah, and these are the reasons why also people like me from academia more and more engage um, in this debate. At the CSP, uh, we offer um, answers to these questions. For instance, if you visit our webpage, you will find a, a guide how impact investments can, should be made, what, what is important for investors in that case. So it's really a, a guide for practitioners who have no real um, clue what, what to do and who are starters in this field. Um, at the same time as academics, we write papers, yeah? So we also have written papers on uh, how to define impact investments, what impact investments should be. And uh, I just want to briefly mention two, I would say um, quite important papers in this field. Uh, in, in one paper, um, we respond to the question, uh, is actually the secondary market, so is, is actually equity, can an equity investment actually be considered an impact investment? Some doubt that. So in that paper, we make the claim, yes, also equity investment and equity fund can be uh, labeled as an impact investment, but we differentiate between two different types of impact investments. And the one we call an impact aligned investment, and the other one would be an impact generating investment. And to, now you might wonder, okay, what is the main difference between the two? Uh, if, if you were to go for an impact aligned investment, the change, the impact has already achieved, has been achieved. Yeah, that's the main idea behind that. So, and what you then as an asset manager, for instance, would have to do is you need to prove to which extent is this investment better uh, compared to a uh, benchmark? Or to which extent does such an investment contribute to the SDGs? That would be impact aligned. And impact generating investments then go one step further. And then there you really would make the claim to, um, to provide additional change in the real economy. And how that might work was addressed by a second paper. And in that paper, we distinguish between uh, investor impact and company impact. And uh, this very notion of investor impact, this is now what, what captures this, this idea of impact generating, uh, generation. Yeah? So that you as investor, you actually can claim it, it was me who contributed, who initiated this change. That can be, for instance, by providing additional capital. Uh, but it also can be through an effective engagement approach. And, you know, this is just uh, like we've seen in the poll. Uh, yes, engagement indeed can be a very effective uh, mean to, to, to change what companies um, are doing. Now, let's have a look at this year's report a little bit more in detail. Um, uh, Kelly, Kelly has um, already shown that impact investment as an old style increased by 70%. That's the highest growth rate we had this year. Um, top five topics for those impact investments were housing, community development, water, in general environment issues, microfinance and energy, climate change. But nevertheless, in some, it's only about 6% of the entire um, market volume. So the consequence is this has some, some, there's some room to accelerate impact investments, but at the same time, it also brings up the question, okay, what are other options, alternatives for uh, initiating change? And that's what we see on this slide here uh, when it comes now to um, engagement. Um, and um, as you've seen on the slides Kelly presented, Engagement now is the second, second most important strategy among all other strategies, which is good news. But then if we look at what, what is addressed in these engagement efforts, uh, we see in some uh, nine topics that are on this slide, 
Uh, and the, the, first, the first thing that we can observe here, uh, it, it is somewhat an even distribution. So there is, of course, there are topics that are more prevalent, but others um, are just a little bit minor, less important, I would say. Um, and in some, we see three environmental related topics, um, climate change being the most important one. Uh, but we also see that um, uh, the down, downstream side, so the product usage phase also matters when it comes to environmental issues. We have two social related themes, human rights and employment conditions. Uh, we have corporate governance, which was basically at the core of, uh, when this notion of engagement uh, came up. But we also see the upstream perspective, supply chain management strategies. And then, of course, broader um, sustainability and business ethics topics that are uh, addressed in engagement efforts. Next slide, please. Um, beyond that, um, I found this a very interesting outcome. Because uh, with one question we ask, um, what do you do in case of norm violations? Yeah. And interestingly, again, Engagement is the top number one response um, that asset managers, as well as asset owners, um, what, what they do when they detect a norm violation. Uh, and then on second place, you see that they then might decide to actually exclude the company. Uh, and just as a side note, what we know from research, uh, exclusions are not, I mean, they ha have an effect but to really change the behavior of firms, uh, you need to um, cross a certain threshold. And that's always the question here. How many will jump the bandwagon with this inclusion strategy? This is just important to be on mind. Therefore, I'm, I think it's good news to see that the first strategy here is, um, again, engagement. Yeah, um, that was my view on some, from my point of view, very interesting outcomes of this year's story. Impact investments themselves um, become more and more important. At the same time, engagement efforts um, are, be are becoming uh, number two strategy overall. This is good news because all these efforts contribute to what should be at the core of what we do with sustainable investments. We contribute to a more sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timo, for digging a bit deeper here and going into the details of approaches. We actually have two questions, one for Kelly and one for you, but we save them for our Q&A. But uh, we see that this also reflects with the audience. Well, now I'd like to pass on to Anja Bodenmann, who will give you an overview on the regulatory trends, both in Switzerland and internationally. Thank you, Anja. Thank you, Sabine. Um, as Kelly mentioned, sustainability, sustainability really is being mainstreamed into many different types of financial products and processes. And a strong driver for this is the increase in public policy and regulatory measures about which I'll be speaking in the next 10 minutes. We see on this chart that sustainable finance is still a young sphere, relatively speaking, of policymaking, but that there has been a clear proliferation of measures in um, the past 10, 20 years. The numbers of measures again increased exponentially in 2020, as um, this chart here shows it's based on the PRI's regulatory um, database. And naturally, these interventions are not just um, clear cut uh, pieces of um, law or acts. There's also measures that are maybe less um, in enforced or with varying degrees of commitment. But just to show the direction is very clear, and we do not expect this to slow down anytime soon. I'd like to focus on Switzerland because it is a Swiss um, market study. And for Switzerland, too, the past year was quite noteworthy because we witnessed very concrete measures being pushed by the government. But before looking at the action points on this slide, it's important to mention that in Switzerland, the government still gives a strong priority to market-based solutions. And for many of the initiatives I'll be mentioning, um, industry associations and market players were included and consulted. So, but if I start, up, start off with the government, um, two key milestones stemmed from the Federal Council, so the governing body of Switzerland, which released first a report in June, 2020, where it did a situation analysis of sustainability in Switzerland's financial center. 
And then this led to an announcement in December 2020 with um, four concrete measures. And I'll be talking a little more in detail about these measures shortly. But maybe to show that there were also another, um, a number of other initiatives on specific topics undertaken by the Swiss government, which was on one hand, for example, the um, second round of the climate compatibility testing with the POCTA methodology. And this second round not only covered the portfolios of pension funds and insurance companies, but also um, asset managers and banks. Two newer and upcoming initiatives are on one hand, the Swiss Green FinTech Network, which was launched by the State Secretariat for International Finance together with inter uh, industry representatives in November. And also uh, quite a new uh, initiative too is the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. Now, this um, is of course not just a Swiss initiative. Uh, it's actually a brand new international initiative that was just launched last week or is being launched this week but Switzerland was an active partner in the preparatory working group. And this shows that its biodiversity um, more specifically is not only an important topic that is driven by civil society, but it has also reached um, the government level too. If we go to the second group of um, measures here on this slide, Swiss public financial bodies also played an important role. Under the existing mandate of funds authorization, the Swiss financial market supervisory authority, the FINMA, introduced um, or started requiring ESG information for um, funds that promote sustainability. And FINMA also very recently, um, just at the end of last month, so May 2021, FINMA announced that it will introduce mandatory transparency obligations on climate risks for large Swiss banks and insurances. Moreover, um, the Swiss National Bank and Compen Suisse, which is the institution that manages the funds of the first a pillar of Swiss social security, they both announced a decision to move out of coal in late 2020. If we go on to the legislative arm, um, looking at Swiss Parliament, there were less items of business filed um, on sustainable finance compared to the year before. But very importantly is the, that the Parliament, Swiss Parliament, adopted a revised CO2 Act, which mainly targets um, real economy, but it also um, con uh, contains two concrete um, uh, references, which require the Swiss National Bank and FINMA to review micro and macro prudential financial risks um, stemming from climate change. There is a small caveat here. This revised CO2 Act still needs to be accepted by the Swiss population in the popular vote um, on the 13th of June. And SSF supports the business campaign for this law. So I do hope um, it will reach the necessary majority. Now, I want to stay with Switzerland for just a tad longer um, because looking forward to the second half of 2021, there are more developments in the pipeline, mainly resulting from this, um, these measures announced by the Federal Council at the end of last year. So if you look here under the first measure, um, the Swiss authorities are currently preparing the mandatory implementation of the TCFD recommendations. TCFD is the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures um, for large Swiss companies. And until that happens, the voluntary application of TCFD is already highly recommended. Enhanced reporting requirements, it's not on this slide, but enhanced reporting requirements also expected in the second half of 2021 are coming from the counter proposal to the responsible business initiative. So we do expect some movement in this field coming um, towards the end of the year. Regarding the second measure proposed by or adopted by the Federal Council, um, the State Secretariat for International Finance is currently also assessing whether there is a need to adapt financial market legislation to prevent so-called greenwashing and also increase the exportability of Swiss financial products. And it has um, consulted and, and sought the opinion of industry stakeholders on this matter. I won't go into detail on the two other matters due to measures due to time reasons, but altogether the expectations from the Federal Council, but also a commitment from the Swiss government to ensure that the competitiveness of the Swiss financial sec uh, center with regards to sustainable finance is also uh, ensured and now going on to the developments um, on the European Union, because they are still very relevant for many Swiss players too. Um, I, assume, I assume most of you are aware of the EU action plan and the 10 EU action points. 
and the finalization and implementation of new rules under this action plan over the past year really has matured even more and has required um, fast adjustments on the part of financial service providers too. And also in that sense, really impacted the Swiss players with uh, um, cross-board activities. Most notably, um, there were various new disclosure related requirements that entered um, or that now apply since March 10th under the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. I won't be going into details on these different types of um, measures or new rules because our next speaker, Victor van Horn, will definitely be able to provide you with more firsthand insights. But just to mention also that regarding the disclosure of climate and other environmental data by companies, um, the EU's non-financial reporting directive is also currently being reviewed and will um, is set to be re renamed and um, um, apply as the corporate sustainability reporting directive. Also on this list is the EU taxonomy, which is still a central piece, of course, of the action plan, and it has also further um, progressed in the past year. Um, even more, even um, more importantly, in the pipeline is already the EU's renewed sustainable finance strategy, which is set to um, further develop the action plan. Um, and I'll also uh, here uh, let uh, Victor von Horn give you more firsthand insights from Brussels. Finally, uh, before closing on the regulatory developments on a global level, there were also um, no, numerous um, national authorities that moved forward on the issue, for example, creating sustainable finance um, advisory committees, assessing taxon taxonomies, were even launching their own sovereign, um, sovereign bonds, sustainability bonds. Uh, on this slide, I've just pinpointed to the most um, notable developments on the country level. First off, we noted that in 2020, many jurisdictions actually emphasized the necessity of sustainable recovery from the COVID crisis. And that when doing so, they also focused on transparency and, and um, improving investor disclosure. So for example, New Zealand became the first government to introduce a proposal for mandatory TCFD disclosure in September, 2020. And this would take effect if it's passed by, by uh, the New Zealand parliament. Similarly, the UK has already introduced mandatory TCFD reporting for large pens pension um, schemes. There's also a clear momentum for sustainable finance taxonomies that goes beyond the EU. Um, just to mention, the UK, for example, announced in November 2020 that it plans to implement a green taxonomy based to a large extent on the thresholds and criteria in the EU the taxonomy. And of course, the work of the international platform on sustainable finance is very important for coordinating policy dialogue um, around these taxonomies. Finally, I want to round off with two important developments um, more on the, on, the, on the level of overarching policy. First, the United States rejoined the Paris Agreement. And in this context, the US Federal Reserve also became a member of um, the network for greening the financial systems, which is really quite an important step. And second, China um, announced the net zero target for 2060, which of course is still quite far off, but we do really expect um, more movement in this direction also with the upcoming climate conference in Glasgow in November 2021. So there is definitely, um, especially on the climate side, much more to be accept expected. Um, to conclude this regulatory overview, we see that finance or sustainable finance policies are really multiplying around the world and some concrete rules are already being finalized and in place. And it'll be interesting to see how these different types of measures um, and approaches interact and to what extent they can really, um, on a global level, effectively contribute to making the financial system more sustainable. And with that, I hand back over to Sabine. Thank you, Anya, for the insights on regulatory developments. It's clear that there will have to be much more discussion for global alignment especially now that we see so much action. Before we continue with our last speaker, we would again like to hear your opinion on the following question. And we are purposefully a little bit provocative. In your opinion, what is the most significant effect of the EU regulation on financial markets? Does it increase climate alignment of investments? Does it steer new financial flows into solutions? Does it provide more transparency for clients? Or does it maybe just increase the costs for the fund managers? 
or does it even create bubbles and is counterproductive? Give us your view on this question and we give you some time to answer it. I give you a few more seconds to make your choice. And I think we should now see the results of the poll. Well, quite obviously, the audience thinks that EU regulation does provide more transparency for clients. We all know SFDR really has this objective. But some of you also think it does increase the climate alignment or it steers new financial flows. So I have to say that's a rather positive start for the comments we will now hear uh, from Victor van Horn as our next speaker. He knows the European environment quite well. And Victor, I think it's good to hear that our audience does not think the EU regulation just creates more costs or even creates bubbles. So what are your comments on it? Thank you, Sabine. Uh, and indeed, I was, uh, I was when studying the questions, I was quite frightful. I have to start my comments with, uh, you know, scattering judgment on what the EU has done in the last couple of years. Um, now, first of all, thank you very much for having me this morning. And, you know, first, congratulations to, to, to Swiss Sustainable Finance on the excellent uh, report. And also to say, you know, we're now very delighted that uh, Swiss Sustainable Finance is a part of the EuroCIF family uh, going forward. So, uh, you know, very much looking forward to this collaboration. Uh, in terms of, uh, maybe we can switch to the next slide, in terms of my comments today, uh, you know, uh, without wanting to, to, to build too much on the, what Anya has said before, which was a great presentation at the beginning, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd you know, dive in straight onto what we're seeing uh, now that uh, the first pieces of legislation of the EU Action Plan of 2018 are being implemented, uh, what we hear back from market participants and, uh, and what uh, some of the challenges may be, as well as you know, providing a, a, look, a picture looking forward into what some of the developments uh, are that we can expect. Um, I think if I look across the EuroCIF membership, if I look at every single country in Europe, I think what's Clearly very obvious is SFDR is rapidly becoming what I would call a common language for the European sustainable investment market. Uh, what's very interesting is wherever you go, uh, I think people, you know, we, we saw this morning uh, with comments by Kelly on Article 9, people in intuitively know what you're referring to. If you talk about Article 6, 8, 9, this is really becoming a common language to the market. So I think what we're seeing is SFDR really has uh, you know, been challenge in implementation, but also uh, you know a new framework for the industry uh, to 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 organize itself, and you know ultimately in line with the policy objectives, get more transparency as the poll showed, but also more comparability across the products. I think this transparency and comparability were the two main drivers uh, of that uh, legislative framework. But I think we're at a stage now where I think we can't deny that there's a number of challenges that we hear from a lot of market participants, and I'm sure it's the same in, 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 in Switzerland uh, for firms impacted. But I think clearly we see the first one is the first challenge is data availability. Uh, the SFDR is a very ambitious framework when it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, particularly things like the principal adverse impact indicators, which is also, I think, a novelty in the legislation worldwide in that it moves the dial away from only looking at uh, returns on investments and the impact of ESG factors on investments, but also look for the first time at trying to, to, to build a framework for understanding the impact of those investments uh, in, the, in the real world. And there, uh, you know, we, we probably had a slight sequencing issue in the action plan in that now there's transparency requirements on financial market participants, but the uh, data uh, availability and quality from industry companies remains a challenge. Um, this will this challenge will probably be compounded uh, as of 2022, when a number of, of, of the more ambitious products falling in the Article 8 or 9 category have to also start disclosing versus the EU taxonomy. So I think that is also another uh, legislation that is very data intensive, uh, and there where you see the same challenges. The second challenge I think we've noted is uh, with uh, individual firms having to make decisions 
on how to classify products. I think we have a wide diversity of investment strategy in the ESG uh, sustainable inv impact investing space. And I think everyone uh, from the onset with SFDR was probably uh, struggling to clearly identify and say, you know, these following investment strategies in which category do I place them and therefore which regulatory obligations do I incur? That unfortunately is, 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 is you know, baked into uh, the regulation itself, which means that uh, firms are struggling still uh, to make those decisions. And I think uh, we are seeing also across Europe a number of regulators understanding this, seeing this in the risk to uh, clients, and therefore as a result uh, are coming up with the local guidance. So we are uh, seeing this, uh, this risk of what I would call, you know, fragmentation of the market whereby different uh, regulators in different countries may adopt different local guidance of our understanding of what they consider under these, these various product categories. So that is, uh, that is something that's unfolding. Uh, we've seen discussions in, uh, in Germany, we've seen discussions in Spain, uh, we're expecting a number of other regulators to, 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 to go down a similar route in the future. So I think that's the... Um, and the third challenge already talked about it is the sequencing of reporting. Uh, we're seeing it now as the rules are still being developed. Uh, and last week, for example, we had a bit of technical rules on the taxonomy being finalized around uh, you know, disclosure of the companies and large financial institutions disclosing how they align in terms of investments with the uh, taxonomy. And again, the sequencing of reporting requirements remains a challenge there with data availability. In terms of next steps, uh, we're expecting over the summer to see the final uh, technical standards uh, under the SFDR, which will uh, spell out in more detail the, uh, the requirements for uh, market participants. We may see some you know, hopefully in additional inter interpretative guidance around some of the uh, classification of products and other elements of the legislation. Uh, and we understand that, that further down the line this year, uh, there may be also reflections around uh, at the European level adopting guidance or rules around uh, marketing communication, because I think we've seen quite divergent styles of communicating about SFDR in the last uh, last couple of months. Maybe moving on to the next slide. I think the you know the in, closely linked, as I said, to the SFDR obviously is the, the taxonomy regulation, which was the cornerstone of the action plan in 2018. Uh, as Anya already mentioned, uh, we've recently in April seen, uh, you know, uh, adoption concretely of the rules around two of the six environmental objectives, climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, the timeline is still where we expect the additional four uh, environmental objectives to be at least adopted in draft form by the end of 2021. Uh, this covers issues like pollution, water use, uh, biodiversity, and protection of natural uh, habitats. So this is, uh, you know, this is uh, this is on track. But it is fair to say, looking at it from based in Brussels, that you know, I think the, the taxonomy has received a lot of political pushback from many European countries, uh, particularly in, in in Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, a number of industries. And I think if you encapsulate those, those pushbacks and the challenges that, that therefore European policymakers are facing in adopting that framework is, is, is threefold. First, um, I think the first challenge is transition finance. Uh, the question becomes, uh, what will the impact of taxon be post its adoption on certain industries that are considered not sustainable or partially sustainable or do not align with those objectives. Is it actually going to translate in, in loss of access, uh, higher funding costs, uh, difficulties to tap capital markets? So the answer is we don't know, uh, but it's not our expectation that it will occur, but certainly you see you know, those discussions. The second thing is in the context of the uh, post-COVID uh, EU recovery budget. The question that very early on was this big, big pot of money that European countries had put together to, to as a, you know, a macroeconomic stimulus following the COVID recovery, uh, people tried to link that to the taxonomy and suddenly a lot of member states woke up to the realization that uh, if their industries, if their economies wanted to potentially tap that European funding, uh, they would need to align with the taxonomy. That is another source of challenge to this access to, to, EU, to, to EU public money in a 
you know, a COVID pandemic recovery context where a lot of industries will be looking for this additional uh, funding. Uh, and finally, uh, and also interestingly linked back to the situation in Switzerland uh, on this climate uh, legislation, we have exactly the mirror uh, thing happening in the EU where the taxonomy, where we have to take decisions on what's sustainable does spill over into many other policy discussions around many other legislative files uh, regulating the real economy, actually. Uh, and you see that with the, 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 the European climate law that uh, enshrined the 2030 and 2050 climate objectives of the EU in law. Uh, but you will see that during the summer with a host of uh, energy-related uh, legislation being proposed where those discussions will emerge. So. That's why it's been very challenging for the taxonomy the last first couple of months. Uh, and we have a, a, a difficult pathway for the rest of the year uh, on those uh, developments. Plus the more uh, questions where we may see some more in the strategy around, do we expand the EU taxonomy to cover social objectives? So the question is, do we need a social taxonomy? Uh, and do we need to, to re-engineer the structure of the taxonomy to also identifying the uh, activity looting or very bad from a climate perspective, so the so-called significant harm taxonomy. So uh, these are some of the developments we should uh, get more clarity on in the, over the next, uh, next few months. Maybe next slide. What's been particularly, uh, I think, important as well from more looking at it more from the, the, the fund distributor side and, and product manufacturer side is how does that, uh, how does the regulatory development in Europe impact distribution actually sale to, to the client? And I think there uh, we seen uh, in end of April, the, the long awaited uh, definition of sustainability preferences in the context of MIFID. Uh, actually quite relevant uh, because it, the, the idea is to mainstream now in the financial advisory process uh, questions around sustainability. So to ensure that clients systematically get asked in that process questions around uh, do they have sustainability preferences. So the idea is a very laudable one and, and we fully support it. Uh, but again, it's going to be quite challenging uh, we hear uh, to make that, uh, to implement that in, in operationally. Uh, particularly as it refers to uh, the SFDR, to the taxonomy, to principal adverse impact indicators, and therefore expects a very sophisticated and high level of knowledge on behalf of the investor about those terminologies, which, uh, which are still you know, relatively new. A lot of that could have been uh, dealt with by the development of the EU label uh, for retail investment products, or the EU eco label, uh, that was uh, also one of the action uh, actions in the uh, 2018 action plan. Um, but there, it's fair to say that the, 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 the EU eco label is, in our expectation, going to struggle uh, quite a bit uh, to get uh, broad market support. Uh, now it seems as the EU eco label has been defined as a very ambitious, purely green uh, label, very uh, you know ticks all the boxes in terms of ambitions, uh, but the systematic feedback we get from, from members across Europe is that uh, the current thresholds now are simply too high, which means that we are unlikely to see many EU eco-label products emerging on the market in the future. So this is something which was you know, a laudable initiative, but it's question mark whether it will pass the test of market practice. Um, Mainly, finally, to move on to the to, the, to my final point uh, around what we can expect in the next uh, EU, EU strategy. Um, as Anya said, we are expecting now uh, around uh, the sixth of July uh, the new strategy, the new renewed sustainable finance strategy of the European Commission that will lay out its policy program for you know 2021 to 2024 so the remaining uh, political mandate of the, the European Commission uh, and which will you know provide all the milestones in terms of policy actions in terms of themes uh, we expect uh, a stronger focus on sustainability risks to the financial system so looking much more at a macro perspective at the financial stability as well as looking at uh, financial institutions uh, and their prudential uh, frameworks banks, insurers, pension funds, uh, and there are even, even talk of mainstreaming climate stress testing uh, for those financial institutions. Another theme will be uh, transition finance. The 2018 action plan, in hindsight, looked very much at defining green, so at defining the very good. But I think the, the policymakers have realized, particularly around the pushback on the taxonomy, that 
the transition finance and how do we transition from here and now to 2050 carbon neutrality is, is going to be a major theme. Uh, and finally, the differences compared to the previous uh, action plan in 2018 that now we have the EU Green Deal, uh, which is a much more holistic uh, policy approach across the whole economy uh, for greening that economy. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, 2018 was very much tailored on the financial institutions. So this is a different, you know, changing of context. What can we expect then in terms of, of, of themes or, or concrete actions? Uh, of course, it's too early to say, but, you know, listening through the grapevine, we can hear that we may see something around labeling, uh, a renewed focus uh, on engagement and, and, and stewardship, hopefully, uh, then also, uh, obviously, uh, corporate reporting and filling this data challenge for financial institutions will be quite important, uh, as well as uh, a, re a new focus on ESG rating and data providers as they are turning out to be uh, very important uh, uh, you know, uh, nodes in the web uh, to make sure the financial system shifts, uh, but are currently, you know, according to, to policymakers in, in the EU, actually relatively falling outside regulatory parameters. So we may see uh, some action around that. Uh, so that's my conclusion for today. And obviously delighted to answer any questions uh, further on in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Victor, for these overviews on the actual impressive pace that we see in the European Union around regulation to drive this development further. I think it will be interesting to see the, the effect and good to hear that, for example, the taxonomy already spills over into the development of other regulations for specific sectors, which is what is key to actually the, achieve the kind of change we need to see. Before we now move to the Q&A session, and we already have quite some questions that we received over the course of the presentations. Before we do that, let me thank you, thank the different parties that were involved in the preparation of this study. The study was compiled with the help of the SSF Market Study Workgroup, which allowed uh, the methodology to be closely aligned to market needs and views. The data analysis was carried out jointly by SSF and CSPs. And uh, in this, I would like to also thank, uh, besides Timo Busch, who was a co-author, also Janis Morgenthaler on the side of CSP, alongside, of course, the SSF team. And last but not least, I would, of course, like to thank all the sponsors of the study that you see on this slide. Without them, we couldn't have managed to launch it. And a very last thank you to our leaving president and for his kind words over the development of SSF over the past six years. His support was crucial on this path. And of course, we look forward to now build on this and even tackle more activities as mentioned. Now, I would want to go into uh, into the Q&A session. And by the way, for those of you that would want to dig deeper, Kelly mentioned it already, we have a microsite on the report, but also look at the PDF, which includes even more details. Now, Q&As. Let me first pick some questions. One was on labels, which labels we cover. That is covered in our report. You find the details there. I can only say it's classical labels such as F and G or Lux flag, but it also referred to Gresby and other labels, for example, in the real estate sphere. I would then want to move on to some of the questions around impact. And we have one uh, from Andreas Holzer that the CSP distinction between impact aligned and impact generating investments seems rather artificial and probably doesn't help to avoid greenwashing. It should be linked to additionality instead. So would you, Timo, agree that uh, the broad use of the term impact is even a reputational risk for the whole sustainable investing sphere? How do you see this, Timo? Yeah, it's a, a very important question. And uh, um, this question really was at the core of the motivation when writing this paper, 
to bring some plus some more insights how different uh, views on the impact uh, topic what different views are and how to um, distinguish them so yes there is a risk of, um, of greenwashing or impact washing and therefore we, we need clear definitions um, now let me maybe just say a few thoughts about the term additionality um, in that paper we discussed that because if you look at all the other uh, like gin definitions, additionality is really important. We refrain from using this term because I think it remains problematic. Uh, practically speaking, um, climate change doesn't care why a ton of CO2 is safe. It's important that the ton is safe. So therefore, we said it's important that we uh, contribute to change. And whether the inflow of capital is additional, yes or no, um, I would argue that is really difficult to prove. Yeah? How do you make sure that this is really 100% sure that no one else would have done it? Uh, so therefore, we basically say it's a difficult um, criteria. Thank you, Timo, for replying to this. There was another question on if we would also cover impact um, impact KPIs in our market study going forward, I would say it's rather difficult because we know the way impact is defined today and the different KPIs that are used really differentiate a lot depending on the type of approach, depending on the sector even that you invest in. So I doubt we, we would be able to cover it on the level of the market study. Another question was, um, but definitely we will try to, to gain more information on impact. Um, I did cover this one, so let's maybe cover the question around the developments of SFDR and its reflection in Switzerland. There's one question if the SFDR classifications the level six, eight, nine of the funds will become applicable in Switzerland. I think we don't know yet what the Swiss uh, direction will be, but clearly the fact that all Swiss providers that are active in European markets have to classify their products, it probably will also leave a mark in Switzerland. We will still see if our government decides to go in the exact same direction or if maybe we will also see a level of adding more information that really provides uh, useful information for the end clients, again, relating back to the impact, what kind of approach can have which impact, but it's really still open. Uh, there was another question about adaptation of principal adverse impacts as a concept more globally. Do you expect that this will be picked up on a global level. I can maybe hand that back to first Victor. How do you think uh, the EU will sort of uh, def make its definition more universal? Uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I'm honest, now the challenge, the, 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 I think that the situation we're seeing in the global landscape, uh, particularly if you look at it from the EU's perspective, is uh, the, the EU has been very much at the forefront the last couple of years of pushing that concept of double materiality, as I alluded to, which covers the financial materiality as well as impact materiality. Uh, but it is fair to say, if you see international developments, that I think other large jurisdictions world, worldwide are, are not quite at that stage yet. And I think we've seen that reflected in, for example, the scope of work that the uh, IFRS Foundation is considering for, in, for international uh, sustainability reporting standards. So the answer is, I expect that for the, in the short term to, to stay a rather European specific thing uh, with the rest of the, with other large jurisdictions such as the US focusing much more on this financial materiality question, uh, but hopefully further down the line, it will, uh, it will you know, be picked up as well. Thank you, Victor. I actually share your view. I doubt this will turn into a global standard rather soon because of different values as well, different starting points in terms of sustainable investing. We then have a question from Ingeborg Schumacher about 
uh, to SSF if we plan to um, assess in the next market study if a product is classified as Article 6, 8 or 9. I cannot tell you yet, but I can only tell you that we will now be involved in the discussions on Eurosif level about future market studies. Eurosif plans to, to come to further definitions for a more aligned data um, assessments. And there we will, of course, take into account the results. And it might well be that this classification is one element of this. Um, maybe more of a comment than a question from the side of a, a representative of, um, of Compens Suisse, who said that they actually have not completely faced out cold, but they have at least reduced their exposure. exposure. Sorry if we were not fully precise in this. Um, there's one question which risks we see that the post-COVID government aid will be little invested in SI. Timo, what do you think? I mean, we wrote this comment last year about the COVID crisis. We saw now how it, how it has evolved. Um, and Victor mentioned the, 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 the packages that also are used towards uh, environmental solutions at least. Do you think sustainable investing will be less prominent after the COVID crisis? No, I, I don't. I don't believe that. Uh, I think uh, it rather will be the opposite. Um, the the trends we observe towards more impact, towards more ESG oriented products, um, they will continue. I don't. I don't believe that uh, COVID will have an effect. Thank you for that. We then have questions that again go more towards the details of the market study. And there's one for Kelly, it comes from Regula Zimza. Could you elaborate more on the high proportion of sustainable funds in the Swiss fund market? How are these funds classified? Is it self-declaration? Yes, it is. But Kelly, maybe you can tell us a bit more. How can it be that 50% of the Swiss fund market now is some, in some ways sustainable? Yeah, so basically, it, again, it is self-declared, um, but uh, what we what we notice is that a lot of, and what you saw is actually uh, one of the most highest ranked um, approaches is definitely still exclusions, for instance. So there's definitely a lot of fund volumes that are maybe only linked to, uh, yeah, very, let's say, we can say a bit more surface level um, approaches. Um, so we're hoping over the years with our data on the combinations of approaches that we'll see those funds that are reported uh, gain a little bit in sophistication. Um, yeah. Thank you for that, Kelly. Now there's another question around ESG reporting, ESG transparency, and one of our um, participants asks, is it likely that it will become compulsory for large Swiss pension funds in the coming years to provide more such transparency? If you ask me, I think, yes, it's likely that it will be become compulsory, not just on the level of funds to provide more transparency, but in a second step also on the level of pension funds. Why do I say this? I just see how the topic has developed over the past has developed over the past two years, and I also see the public pressure to provide more transparency. And my expectation is that sooner or later this will not just remain with the asset managers, but will also move one level up to the asset owners. It I don't know how fast this will happen, but definitely I think this will be a trend. We now have time for about one, maximum two questions. And um, I try to take one of the less complex questions. There's a clear question to Timo, measuring the impact of ESG engagement can, can be challenging as it is often rather qualitative. Is there an acknowledged method to show the impact engagement had on a fund. What's your view on the role of engagement measures and impact measures? 
Uh, I thought you, uh, I thought you said less complex questions. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I try to give an answer. Um, um, but when we come back to this classification that I propose, I would say to, um, to, to measure an impact aligned fund, that's, that's out there already. You can do a benchmark analysis, you can show to which extent uh, you are SDG aligned or something like that. So that's all there. But when it comes to really impact, um, measuring impact generate, generation, um, I, would, I would say probably the most, uh, the, what I know, the best tool for out there uh, was proposed by, by the GIN. Um, there, last year they published a, a report for standardized and comparing impact performance. I would say that gives a good, uh, there are good examples and good hints how to do that, how to measure that. So um, the, from my point of view, the, it's not a problem that we can measure individual impacts. Um, the challenge is if we have different impacts. Yeah, so how can we aggregate that maybe to one, one impact number, one impact figure? Um, so just think about supply chain issues versus climate change. I mean, both have, uh, in both areas, an investment can have an impact. So how, do you put both into the same basket? Uh, and then it get, gets even more complex if you have positive impacts and negative impacts. How, how do you deal with that? So these are the open questions in the room where I think um, also as, from a research point of view, uh, we, we have our tasks to do. Thank you, Timo. A relatively short answer to indeed quite a complex question, and there will be more work to do on this subject. Um, I start, I, I, I stop with a very easy question. Will this presentation and uh, the whole webinar be made available? Yes, it will be. You will find everything on our website. The report is already online. So please visit the SSF micro site on the study, but also download the PDF for more details. At this point, I would really like to thank all of you that uh, made this webinar so interesting. Even for me, it was interesting to learn more new aspects about the whole market and the development. Um, I would like to thank all the participants. We had many of you in this webinar. And I would, of course, like to point out to some of our next, next activities. One was already mentioned by our president on 22nd of June at our annual conference. We will present the SSF recommendations on ESG transparency for portfolios. So please join us again. It will again be broadcasted, the event. And apart from that, you will see and read more from us over the course of the summer. We much look forward to having you on board again for future events. So thanks to all of you for having been with us and have a good rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>